This is the Greenfield Public Schools School Committee meeting. It's Wednesday, July 13th, 2022, 6 p.m. We're at the John Zahn Community Center, 35 Pleasant Street. GCTV is recording this meeting. We'll go right into the agenda and do a roll call. Member Deeve? Here. Vice Chair, uh, Secretary Ekstrom here. Member Johnson Massad? Here. Member Martini? Here. Chair Proietti? Here. Vice Chair Wall? Here. Here we go. Here. We are all present and have a board. Wonderful, that is uh, 6.01 p.m. We'll call to order and let's move right into the approval of the minutes from June 8th. Uh, can I get a motion to approve those minutes, please? So moved. That was Member Wall and a second. Second, Rita Gartner. Second from the mayor. Any discussion of the minutes? I have a question. In the minutes it says that there was, oh man. Mm, oh. Maybe I'm, it says the, there was new business, but I don't believe that there's been new business for a little while. I don't think there was new business last time and I'm, I'm hoping there can be new business in the future. We could always do new business. Cool, I just noticed that it didn't happen last time and it's on the minutes. I don't know that that's true. I recall asking for new business at okay. the last meeting. Okay. Anything else? Okay, we'll move to a vote. Anyone abstaining from voting? Anyone voting no on the minutes? Okay, so those pass unanimously. And we'll go into public comment. Looks like, are either of you here for public comment? Yes, yes, both of you? No? Greta's not here for public comment. Oh. So I have the whole glasses thing. I forgot it was you, Greta, because I have my close-up glasses on, sorry. <laughs> Jasper, you're here for public comment? Okay, oh, we didn't do a microphone Mike. there. Philippe, do you mind? We'll give you a microphone. Um, you know how it works. Give us your full name, where you live, and you'll have three minutes. I don't need three minutes. That's fine. Is it close enough? Yes. So my name is Jasper Lapienski, 34 Washington Street. In the late 1980s, this book, I Like Cats, was borrowed from the library at the Green River School, and it was never returned. Um, it fell through a hole in the floor, and last month, I opened up a wall in my neighbor's house, and it fell out. So I have come here to return it. <laughs> because it says in the front cover, and this is a stamp, property of school committee, Greenfield, Massachusetts. Article 55, pupils shall be held responsible for books and supplies loaned to them until such material has been returned to the teacher. In case of injury or loss of a school book by the pupil, the teacher shall require him, it just says him, to repair or buy a new book. And I said it's a stamp because buy is spelled B-Y. <laughs> the last person to borrow it there's no date, the previous date to that was 1988, um, was somebody named Shara who was in room number one back when there was a Green River School. If you're listening, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And you are returning the book to the school committee? That's right. We're as honored directed to take by it. the inside front cover. Thank you very much. That is terrific. That is a great story. Thank you, Jasper. We looks like we clearly have no other public comment this evening. Um, and we'll move uh, actually ahead with the agenda. The next item uh, is on there erroneously. We do not have stu student representatives uh, do a report during the summer. We'll pick that back up for maybe next month, probably the September meeting. I would assume so. Okay. And so we'll go into the uh, reports from ASKP and Christine. So um, Karen is notably absent. She is taking a vacation. So you have her report in writing. Um, she's following up her written report to me is following up on the status of the use of the CKLA curriculum resources that she's been speaking of, the illustrative math, 
um, talking about some end of year wrap ups that she and I both did regarding our professional development. Um, Karen applied for and was awarded a grant for civics. She did ask for 20,000 but got 17,000 but we'll still take that. And um, it's to continue the civics instruction at the high school. And then the library's assessment, the weeding and um, refurbishment of books in the elementary libraries is continuing. And then she is having um, three new teachers join our contingent of mentors for the upcoming school year. And um, I will say Karen and I talked about her offering a mentor training. So she will be reaching out to the teaching staff shortly to gauge interest to see because we know how important our professional status mentors are in the district. So she will see if there's interest in facilitate, you know, her facilitating a mentor training. Thank you. Sure. Any questions from the school committee about ASKP's report? I Go do, ahead. but maybe um, I can. We'll see if I can answer. I, I can save them for next time or something. Um, but uh, in looking over her report earlier, I did have a couple of questions. So I was wondering um, what impact you hope to see on student outcomes from the adoption of the new ELA curriculum in K-7 to and how you'll go about measuring that. So certainly our ex, well, our intention with the adoption of high quality instructional materials is to improve student outcomes. One of the pieces that was really important for me coming on, and I know the committee from my interview process, was that we had a consistent resource available to all students across the elementary and until the adoption of this resource, that was not the case. So now we have one uniform resource available to guide the progress of instruction. It is a standards-based resource, so geared to address all of the Massachusetts standards and mathematics for those grades. But what it really does is provide consistency in instructional access across the grades. The goal is to see improved performance. We'll be using the unit assessments through CKLA, Dibbles, you know, longer term, the, the summative assessments from the state, such as MCAS, the MAP testing, um, we would expect to see some growth over time. But it takes a while of continuous improvement before skills are at such a level that you start to see the impact of those on broader standardized assessments like MCAS and MAP. But we'll be watching the Dibbles and the unit assessments very carefully. Thanks. Sure. I was wondering um, also kind of bigger picture, what in addition to the new curriculum do you feel is um, needed in order to improve literacy outcomes in the district? There's actually a lot of pieces that need to happen to improve literacy. We made a couple of steps in that direction and actually I speak to them in my evaluation summary. But first we adopted a consistent kindergarten screening. We didn't have a consistent tool that was being used. So the ability to gather data for all of our students was varied as they came into the district and that can impact how we think about grouping our students for small group, identifying students who require intervention, who may not come in with the readiness skills that we would love for our students to see. Um, we can also track students if we're using a consistent resource on the impact that preschool has on entry skills. Um, so those are all some data points, but we've, we've taken one step there. We need to complete written units of instruction. So um, the, a, a full curriculum includes not just the resource, but unit maps that talk about which standards are being addressed, common assessments, um, samples of lesson plans that can be used. It also helps teachers with the pacing of instruction so that they know 
how they should be moving through units to cover all of the standards by the end of the year. So all of that has to happen. I expect, and it's fair, that our elementary teachers would need ongoing support in learning how to use the new resources. Um, it's been a trend for a while to do the reader's workshop format for instruction in literacy, and our DESE content specialists are talking about how the recommended approaches are coming away from that, so there's more full class instruction now with differentiation. So it's fair that in a switch of instructional approach, we would need to support staff with that. We also need to develop uh, more form formally the process we go through to identify students who require intervention early on, our tier two supports, title one supports, um, and how we monitor, how we do, um, you know, our data collection, how frequently we're doing that, what our benchmarks are for moving in and out of intervention. And I would um, also say we need to do some formal identification of our data review process for students, for grade levels, for the district, and that speaks to changes we need to look at in curriculum first. If you don't have the majority of your students meeting benchmarks, then first you look at curriculum to see if it's meeting your needs, and then we start looking at things like are the assessments measuring what we really want them to and giving us valid points? Do we need to talk about best practices with instruction? So we have a lot of pieces, but I want to share, we have very skilled staff. So I have no doubt we will be where we need to be, but there are pieces that have not been in place for the staff for a number of years that we need to help provide for them. So those are some of the pieces you need. Thank you. Well, you obviously know this backwards and forwards because you're able to really um, just kind of dive through all of that. Um, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, on behalf of our older students who will not have had the benefit of these changes that yep. are coming for K to seven, who are struggling in this area, what are we doing for them? And do we need to make changes or provide additional things to support them? So at the secondary, I would say my comments about the data review process, the written curriculum, the review of resources, as we know, the high school hasn't just had the benefit of looking at their instructional resources. Um, so all of those pieces hold for all of our staff at all grade levels. They, they also don't have the resources that um, they should be able to have access to. The process, the child study team, SST, whatever it's called in our different buildings. Um, there is a process at the high school, but of course we should always be evaluating whether our processes are effective. And um, we have intervention at the high school. We have Title I support, so it's really looking at helping our staff in that regard make sure they have the assessments they need to monitor the students the way that they need to. Um, so it's not really a different thought process. It's just, um, you know, there's a level of urgency as the students are advancing. But, um, you know, we need to continue doing the assessment of our curriculum instruction and assessment across the district. We have just begun that process. But again, I know we have, um, our staff is able to help our students meet the standards. We just need to give the district some resources. You had touched on um, students with disabilities or students who have a more intensive need mm -hmm. um, in this area, and I know we had um, talked about it a little bit uh, at the last meeting, and um, as I recall, you had um, planned on having conversations with um, Janet Dickinson, our special education mm -hmm. administrator, about um, how to maintain enough staff who have a high level of training in more intensive 
structured literacy methods. And I'm just wondering, uh, is that still an ongoing conversation or has there been um, any new information or forward movement in that? Well, that's always an ongoing conversation because like the elements of our core curriculum, we have to continually evaluate all of our special education services. Um, Janet is working on getting training in some of the language-based systematic literacy approaches. Um, and you know that's, that's the first piece. Unfortunately, we have to negotiate how to get, I don't mean negotiate from a, a collective bargaining strategy uh, approach. My negotiate means figure out how to provide a fairly intensive, comprehensive level of training with very little professional development time in the school calendar. So we're working on that, how to manage to get it provided for all of the appropriate staff within the time that we have. So, um, but that's, that's also a very individualized conversation because we can train staff in an approach and then um, it's a good basis, but that doesn't always work for every student and we have to be responsive to individual needs if, if that's indicated. So, um, you know, you can't just say, like with our core, CKLA is our elementary resource. It doesn't necessarily um, work in the exact same way for special education instruction. So, but that's always an ongoing conversation. We always have to evaluate our programming. Uh, one more, I, you had mentioned the um, different types of data that you would be using to evaluate mm -hmm. how the uh, new ELA curriculum is gonna um, play out in terms of student outcomes. And I was just wondering what um, sort of data or assessments you would be using for the math. Actually, those are in my evaluation data. Um, there are unit assessments in the math resource that's included. Um, there is also a number sense assessment that's connected with our AVMR um, approach to number sense that's used actually all the way through the middle school. So, um, and then of course we have MAP and MCAS, which are longer down the road. Um, but the coaches have been working with teachers around ways to modify some of the very lengthy math assessments that are included with the resource. There's a balance between having, you know, I, I don't know that it's 30, but 30 questions on every standard versus being able to get through the assessment, get valuable information, and change your instruction with it. So they're working on how to modify those assessments to be efficient and effective. So right now, those are the assessments that we've got for our math. Sorry, I thought of one more while you were speaking. Um, I, I wish Karen weren't on vacation. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you know this one. She probably does. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, you have to do all the heavy lifting here while she's gone. That's OK. I actually enjoy talking about instruction. <laughs> Um, I understand uh, that DESE has been collecting um, curriculum in use information from districts to be added to district profiles um, okay. so that they can be um, available to the public and that is supposed to be rolling out this month, although I don't see it as of today. And I was just wondering if we are uh, all set with that, have we provided that information to DESE and um, if it will be ready the to go? The district profile information has not come to me, so I don't know if it's been sent to us or not yet. Okay. So. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions on the assistant superintendent's report? Okay. We'll move on to the superintendent's report. I don't want to do mine now. No. <laughs> Kate, I am teasing you. I truly do like having an instructional conversation. I promise to have more questions for the superintendent. That is yes. fine. So I'm actually going to um, defer this because Greta, our food service director, is here. And so I will let her talk to you about summer eats. I won't. Um, talk to you about that. There's a list of 
projects that Eric Heavey is overseeing in addition to the regular cleaning, which by no means is well represented by saying the regular cleaning. It's a very comprehensive top to bottom um, scouring of the district. Um, but there are some projects that are identified, many of which are actually capital projects that had been on hold for a while that are now being addressed. Um, there is a fence project that Eric is working on for Newton, but the land abuts conservation land, so Eric needs to have a conversation with the Conservation Commission about that work, so it's a little bit delayed, but that's moving forward. He knows what he needs to do to get that um, continued. So again, I sort of preempted myself in some of my report with the evaluation information, so I'm gonna skip around a little bit. As of January, uh, July 6th, we have 106 kindergarten students enrolled already, and we expect more, uh, about 25 to 30 more based on the trends from last year. But Sierra Rother, who's our registrar, said that we luckily have been ahead of the game in terms of getting more students enrolled earlier this year. So that's wonderful. Um, we would like to invite all of you to come visit our buildings prior to the start of school opening. Um, we're trying to balance availability of all of the administrators and the completion of the summer work, which is why the date is, um, we're looking at August 23rd at 4.30 as the date that would work for all of that. And um, we will also be inviting the city council and the members of the planning and construction committee. So if it works for the majority of you, I will then extend an invitation to the other two groups and um, we'll create a specific itinerary for everybody so that you can see all or as many of the buildings as you're able that night. So we really would like to highlight any of the projects we've been able to complete, especially those funded through capital, um, show off any of the new technology that was graciously paid for by um, through the capital projects, and also highlight the work that our custodial group is doing this summer to get the buildings ready for you. And to allow you to see the buildings with the eye on um, NASDAQ's view, um, because they've definitely highlighted some things that I think you'll see in a different perspective going through now that you have their um, their lens looking at it from a use perspective. So um, we will also be hosting a back to school VAX bus in collaboration with FERCOG and the health department. So that will be also August 23rd, but nine to 12, so um, not at the same time. And then I have two, two hires that I would like to share. You probably know, um, you may know, Michelle Fenimore, who was an assistant principal at our middle school, took the Federal Street principalship, and then she was out for uh, family leave for most of last year. She is returning as our middle school principal for next year. She's extremely excited, as are we. And then yesterday, we were able to hire a new director of technology. So Dr. Joel Losky has joined our district. He's been in private, um, he's been in corporate America for a couple of years, but he was a, in, an educational director of technology for a number of years prior, and we're very excited to have him start. He will be with us um, mid-August, but he's extremely excited to get back into um, schools. So we're... Yeah, so Mike, in the meantime, Mike Savinas is really doing a lot of work for us. Um, I'm trying to help, but I'm not the technology wizard that um, Dr. Lasky will be, so Mike's tolerating my help. <laughs> um, okay, that's... How about questions from the school committee? 
Member Johnson, you said, go ahead. Just an appreciation for the invitation to visit the buildings. It's something that I think is really important for us to get to do and hasn't been done in a formal way um, as long as I've been on the school committee. So I appreciate you for organizing that and I, I'll be there. Absolutely, we're happy to show off. Member Deneve, go ahead. I just want to echo the appreciation from Glenn and thank you for being interested in inviting the council members because I've been talking to Sheila and Councillor Bullock for a couple months about this and I know I emailed you mm -hmm. about their interests. So I'm really glad that you're including them. Happy I think it to will have be great. them. Yeah. Other questions? Member Martini, go ahead. I um, had a couple of questions on the topic of hiring. I wondered um, where we are with the Director of Behavioral Services. We actually are pleased that we will be having someone in that position, but it will be through a contract. Um, but we, we have someone they have not quite started yet, so I'll wait until they're fully onboarded before announcing, but we will have someone serving in that role. And then more generally, how are we doing um, for staff in the fall at this point? Um, I didn't check before I came to the meeting tonight, but we've hired a number of special educators in, in all of our buildings. Um, we were able to hire a middle school library media specialist, which is um, having a light, uh, certified library media specialist is something that um, we hadn't had, we had the library staffed for a number of years, but we're able to have someone who's certified in that position, so we're very happy. Um, still working on the elementary one, still working on IT, but um, there are a few positions still posted, so I'm, I'm not completely up to date. That sounds good, thanks. Okay, sure. Other questions for the superintendent? All right, thank you. Moving right along, I think it's the Greta show, is that right? Oh wait, um, why don't we, do, does, does anyone mind if we, we can do a motion all that, can we just have Greta do the, I skipped a few things to get to her, do the uh, increase in student meal prices. Is anyone opposed to that? Okay, Greta, if you don't mind, would you step up here? Well, it'll be helpful. So thank you for coming in tonight. Um, if, if you don't mind, oh yeah, just hit the button. You might have to hold it for a second. When it turns green, there you go, you're good. Um, so we're talking about the increase in prices. Um, there's some uh, difference from previous years because of the, is it CEP, is that what it's called? Yeah. So if you could explain what's happening and what you're suggesting, that would be helpful. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, this is my first time at a school committee meeting here, so. I'm excited to be here. Um, and I have some exciting news. So previously, we've been a CEP district for five of our schools, but Four Corners was not included in that grouping. Um, but because of the higher need that we've seen with the pandemic, our, it's called ISP. It stands for Identified Student Percentage. Um, it's basically the number of students that directly qualify and certify for free meals. That is higher than ever before, so we've managed to include Four Corners in that grouping with a higher rate than we had previously, even without them. So it's really increased, um, and we are excited to announce that all six schools will be free breakfast and lunch for students next year. Um, we were very timely in getting in our data. I think my DESE rep told me we were the first ones that they actually validated. So we haven't gotten the official letter. That'll come in late August. But you know, we, I, in my packet, it's been approved and validated. So that will start in the fall. Um, so it's very exciting. I know that a lot of parents will be excited to hear that. Um, and yeah, so talking about school lunch rates, this really only applies if a student wants to purchase an additional meal. So if they get a free breakfast or lunch and then want a second breakfast or lunch, that's when these prices kick in. So all first meals for students in the district will be free. Um, we do have to have prices set and there is a requirement per deci to exceed a certain weighted average. So that is $3.31. So when considering the number of kids at each grade level, 
you know, that's how you determine this, this weighted average. Um, so, you know, a 25 cent increase per grade level will give us a higher weighted average than the minimum. And that, will, that should hold us over for another year so we don't have to vote on this next year. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't believe we've had a documented breakfast price. Uh, so I just want to get something on the record and you know so that we have it on paper that it would be two dollars If a student wants to purchase an additional breakfast great Super helpful information. Thank you um, Before we do a motion and a vote to approve do, do folks have any questions for Greta from the school committee? Yes, yeah, it stands for community eligibility provision. And essentially, if enough students in a particular school or grouping of schools qualify for free meals directly through programs like SNAP. So that's why it's very important. I urge families at home, if you haven't applied to SNAP, to please apply, because the more people that participate, the more direct certifications that we will get, the higher this rate will go. Um, and once, so our rate for next year will be 59.5%. Um, if we exceed 60%, it's basically financially beneficial for our department in terms of how we get reimbursed from the state. Um, and I will say that this status will last uh, through fiscal year 26. So we will not have to reapply. But if this rate continues, I'll, I'll monitor the rate, and if it keeps going up, we can reapply with a higher rate, which will lock us in even longer with a better rate. So that's what that means, yeah. That, that's called new cafeteria math, is what that is, right? Yes. That's the official name of it. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Greta, I just want to acknowledge, I know you came in, in kind of mid-year this year with us, and um, the energy that I've seen from your program is just really phenomenal. Um, I was very sad to be ill, personally ill, and miss the, uh, the beginning of the summer food service program down at the river, but it, uh, the pictures were amazing, and um, it's clear you guys really are dedicated to our students, and that's great, so thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, we have wonderful staff, and the kickoff was very well attended, despite the weather, we had a great time, so yes. sorry to miss you. The weather like held off, right? But my recollection is it yeah. was okay, yeah. It was good. Good, good, well thank you. So um, I would at this point uh, move or accept a motion to accept the lunch price increase as proposed by the GPS Food Service Department and which will apply only for purchases by students of additional lunches for a 25% per meal increase for the 22-23 academic year. Anyone like to move that? So move. That was Member Wall and a second. Second. Was that Member Martini? Good job. Any further discussion? Okay, any, uh, any votes abstaining? Any uh, no votes? Wonderful, so that passes unanimously. Great. Do you want me to touch briefly on Summer Eats updates while I'm up here? I or would love you want to come that, back to me? For, especially for people who are listening at home or who watch this and will want the information. Yes, Absolutely. so also very exciting news from our department. Um, due to the passage of the Keep Kids Fed Act, I believe last week, there are new USDA waivers in place that allow us to again serve grab-and-go meals. So starting today, actually, it was the first day we opened six grab-and-go sites or we transitioned some sites to grab-and-go, opened uh, Greenfield Middle School again. So from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., uh, parents can drive through and pick up meals. Kids do not need to be present for meal pickup. Um, and we're distributing a breakfast and a lunch all at one time. So I know a lot of parents have been asking for this. I've been seeing it on social media. So so we're really, really happy to be able to return to grab and go. And I did send a school messenger out to parents today, so they should all have that information. That grab and go was really popular during the pandemic phase when the schools were remote. So yeah. 
Um, I, I can understand after doing it with my kids why it's a popular program. So yeah. thank you for it's putting a, that in place. It's incredible. And I just want to shout out my amazing staff who just right away, this, the day that we found out, even before, you know, Desi sent us a notification at 4.45 p.m. on a Friday. And they had already spoken with Eric about setting up a room at the high school to do the grab-and-go meals. They were already ordering, you know, paper goods and very on top of it. So it's been a pretty smooth transition. And we're just working on updating our marketing to reach families so terrific so much. well thank you for being here thank you for all the information and all your hard work and thank your staff for us as well all right thank you everyone thank you. have a great night all right that's always good to have the good news right good stuff small increase that won't really impact anyone at all except the, the big eaters um, okay, so where did I leave off? We did the administration reports. So we have the um, school committee reports. I'll do a quick report. I have a few things um, that are pretty minor. So the first one, we have talked in the past and we're moving forward with doing a school committee self-evaluation process. I've been working with Liz LaFond from MASC on that. Um, and we have a actually a survey monkey tool that MASC has put together. So the um, it'll be an online self-evaluation that will be compiled by Liz on our behalf. Once we have um, tonight or tomorrow morning, I will push the link that she's provided to me out to all of the school committee members. Um, we should decide on a timeline for actually submitting the self-evaluation because we want her to be able to compile it, I think, in time for our, I'd like to do it at the August meeting, the, the um, summary. So if, what do folks think in terms of uh, getting, the, getting yourself, your own self-evaluation completed is a week enough time to do that? Do you want until like next Friday? Can I ask some questions? Of course. Um, how long does, is, does Liz need to compile data and get it into a presentable format? I think, I, I think we, I would like to give her, um, you know, at least 10 business days, I think. Um, and if we needed to do the compiling or do our public piece in September, that's okay too. If we, if you wanted to give her 10 days, it would have to be completed by the 27th of July. Okay. And two weeks from. Hey, there we go. Does that work for everyone if we give you two weeks? Anyone have uh, want that timeline to be different? Go ahead. Are these just a few questions? Is this We did give questions? you a copy of it. You got a copy <laughs> of it at the last meeting. It is very involved. It is a number of different rubrics related to how we are expected to perform as a school committee. Um, certain areas like policy, things like that, and you go through and you answer questions about how you think we perform. And there's a, it's a, like a radio button with a comment section for each one. Okay, I don't think I got anything at the last meeting, but okay, but as long as it's not essay didn't questions. No. We didn't hand it out at the last no, meeting? It was in the packet. It was in the packet, thank you. Or Glenn. maybe it was two it was times in, ago, but anyway, it was. It was in like May, I think. Yeah. Okay, but you did, it, we did pass it out. It's not, this is we not got something hard we have copies of it. Out in a pack packet, it wasn't on the agenda and it wasn't kind of given to us with very much notice, so people might have missed it, but it was included in the packet, but not that, that's distributed the thing I'm thinking. Okay, electronically. Okay. And I did ask for folks to get back to me if they wanted any of the questions changed. And the only people that I heard from were uh, Jean and Ekstrom, who didn't want to change anything. I didn't hear from anyone else. So we went ahead with what MASC had given us. And, and she's put it in a survey monkey to make it not written. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it was the May we can, I mean, we can go back and distribute it. You're going to get the link at the end of this meeting. It is. It's all the same. Yeah. Now it's in a nice online package that's really, I tested it. It's very easy to fill out. And she'll get the information and compile it for us. So we'll do, uh, do on the 27th submitted through the link that I will send after the meeting tonight. And certainly let me know if you have questions. Okay, so that's the self-eval. Um, there have, so at the last meeting in June, we talked about a slight change to subcommittee assignments. 
for the school committee, which was the sick bank change to a representative and an alternate. So I did push out to everyone um, the link for this subcommittee assignment. It's just like a little spreadsheet that shows that change was made. And then also, because we now have the NESDEC information that we've been waiting on, we're gonna start up again with the redistricting subcommittee is gonna start meeting. And that subcommittee has just had a slight change. Um, Jean is, it will stay as, as the chair and um, I took myself off and Glenn is gonna be on it along with Elizabeth, um, which was a previous discussion that we've had. Um, and that work um, will start whenever we can get a meeting scheduled. And with those meetings, uh, school committee members are always welcome to attend even if they're not a part of the actual uh, committee. And this is a big one. We're gonna talk about the enrollment projections. We're gonna talk about um, facility assessment stuff, all the stuff that came from the NASDAQ report. We also have been asked to look at changing start times for the middle and high school. We've been um, on and off talking about uh, walkability for our schools. That's been a big issue. It's an equity issue for sure. Um, and then the pieces, the biggest pieces around um, how do we best serve our students by the structure in which they travel through the different schools. Do we keep them kind of separate at the elementaries? Do we do a cohort model? That type of thing. So all of that's gonna be discussed within the structure of that redistricting subcommittee and they will start meeting soon. And thank you to Jean, Glenn, and Elizabeth for being willing to do that work. Sure, Not yet. We just wanted to let you know first to, to warn you. You're gonna start meeting. <laughs> um, and then I think that's everything I have for the report from the chair and then subcommittee reports I've been literally sick for like three weeks so I've lost track of if anyone was meeting I definitely didn't go to a subcommittee anyone meet <laughs> okay I, I went to the representative collaborative I went to wonderful the let's have a report well, I don't really have a report because I That's did fine. go to one meeting. Yep. And I really was not clued into what was going on, but they're very, very kind. They are. And we're all buddy buddy now, and they're very sweet, and we're all chatting, and it feels great. Great. And um, I look forward to doing it next year. Great. Yeah. And yeah, and you know, my understanding f from the little I've dabbled in the collaborative is that. Greenfield is pretty high-end users of the collaborative. We use a lot of their services. We have a lot of their stuff in place. So it is something we wanna, as we're able, build that, that uh, representative relationship. Yeah, there were some great things that we could have used last year had I known what I was required. So, but they're, but they're gonna help me and they're very kind and I think we'll have a good experience next year. Thank you. Any other things that would fall under subcommittees? So I, did, I was the rep for two years. They are really helpful and want to do anything possible they can to support anyone, any of the, the board members, and also they serve food every time, at least they used to. Well, it's all remote now. Oh, oh. that's too bad. But they yeah, don't they send really, a DoorDasher to your house? They, they really are very, they're a great organization and really helpful and they know what they're doing. So if you have questions for them, ask immediately. I, I have been, yes. Good. Anything else for subcommittees? All right, awesome. Uh, thank you all. And then we do have the information for our budget update. Um, Andy has a personal uh, conflict and isn't able to be with us tonight. I don't know how, what is that? Oh, is it in the packet? No. Oh, uh, the, the superintendent has come prepared with notes about the budget. Please go ahead. Well, I wanted to just share that we are um, wrapping up the end of fiscal year 22. And again, as, as Andy or I, as the case may be, have talked about the fact that you may see some of the budget lines that still represent a negative. Um, I wanted to let you know the plan at this stage for um, zeroing that out in that we will um, reclass approximately 146,000 to transportation revolving, that we will reclass um, just under 500,000 from special ed tuition revolving, 
and the remainder of that negative balance will come from school choice. So it will be, um, we will be even by the close of the fiscal year. I know the mayor had that question, rightly so, last time, so I wanted to make sure we shared the plan. Yeah, that's, I, I assumed. I didn't expect it to stay there. No, they will definitely, um, we're, we're still finalizing any of the encumbered, you know, the, the purchase orders that are holding, holding money for um, one way and then um, closing up some grants. So that's the anticipated plan and the anticipated local negative balance at this stage. Any questions about the budget? All right. I don't have a question on the Go ahead. Great job. Thank you. I know how much work you guys have been doing, and I know there's been nothing easy about it, and it's, probably makes your eyes cross a lot, but great job. It's, um, I, I don't mind the budget work, uh, yeah. so yeah. It's, um, it, it's been good. It, it, it's, you know, when you, things can't align and you can't get it all, it's frustrating, but it's like a puzzle you have to go through, and but great job. Thank you. I think we're able to look at funding, um, differently than has been thought about in prior years. And so we're looking at using the resources we have in different ways by moving some things. So I think it's really gonna be beneficial f for the district in the long run. All right, moving on from the budget, we've done number eight, which is the increase to the student meal prices. So number nine, is a vote to approve the job description for a nurse leader position within the district. Um, do you wanna talk about this? Yes, I'm happy to. So one of the things that has become pretty clear, and I'm, I'm no doubt saying this to people who are well aware, but the work of a school-based nurse in the past several years has been probably undefinable, just unbelievable amounts of work in the past few years, but some of the feedback that I've had from multiple of our district nurses, um, including our most recent nurse leader, Kelly, who um, moved on to different plans, um, is feedback that we need a full-time nurse leader. The work of a full-time nurse leader, as you can see from the job description, is very comprehensive, and it is not in any way reasonable to think that a full-time school nurse could do this with a stipend position. Um, the work that needs to happen just in policy and facilitating our wellness committee and training, ensuring that we're compliant with laws, working with our medical advisor, overseeing the nursing work of our nurses, assisting with supplies. They would have been the full-time liaison with the health department. Um, all of the things that I've identified in this job description um, are needed in Greenfield and it's really, I think, a disservice, truthfully, to our current nursing staff to ask any of them to take this on for a stipend. It's just um, an undoable job. So at this point, um, I am asking for you folks to approve a job description. I would like to post the position, hopefully get someone interested in in a wonderful opportunity to work with a great group of nurses across the district. And um, I hope that we have a nurse leader out there. <laughs> but um, so it, let's do a motion and then discussion and then we'll vote. Um, I would take a motion to approve the creation of the GPS district nurse leader job as proposed. So moved. Weed Gartner. Thank you. A second. Second, Johnson Musad. Thank you. And let's discuss. Who has questions? I don't have any questions. I just read through it and I was tired. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it was it's a, a ton of work. It's, a, it's an enormous job. It yeah. is, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, yeah. I, I, I truly believe uh, people have no idea, as is the case with so many mm -hmm. of the jobs that we do here in the city. But no, that was was extensive. Or yeah. is extensive. So. It is. I, I believed we needed one, but then to hear from the nursing staff that they felt we needed one sort of drove the point home. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess from for me, I think the huge positive is it's great to see you have something big that happens that's unexpected, that stresses your resources, like a pandemic. And as a part of recovering from that, we learn and we put supports in place for something for the next time around. That's how I see this, because we have not ever had this. And in your experience, is this a standard thing pre-pandemic? Um, different districts do it in different ways. Um, the two districts where I have worked previously did have full-time nurse leader positions, but I know other some other districts share them. Mm -hmm. And maybe in years to come, when a lot of the foundational work yeah. is set, then the committee may you know, look at options, but right now I think there is a lot of foundational work because our nursing staff has absolutely not been able to do some of the things that they've wanted. And it's, um, it's just, there's, there's some basic work that has to get yeah. put into place. But there, there are some different models, but I have had the experience of having a full-time yeah. nurse leader. Other questions or discussion? Yeah, please, Member Denise. Um, number five, uh, assist in the development and implementation of attendance protocols. Is that something that hasn't been going? Because as a parent, I've noticed that's where things slide. Like, I, I don't get notifications when my child is absent. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm so glad that you're doing this, and I heartily approve and I'm excited for it. But I'm just curious, is that, it, will that it, take care of that problem? But is no, that that? <laughs> it's a different piece. Okay. So of when I reference attendance protocols, and thank you for the question, maybe that wasn't the best way to frame it, but what I'm referencing in this job description is how we work with families for students who have a high number of absences. Okay. Many times there are underlying health issues and it's always helpful to have nursing be part of those conversations. Um, depending on the situation, oftentimes the family needs assistance figuring out how their child with medical issues can be cared for at school. We need someone who can have conversations with doctors. It's, but it's those types of things, and so the nurse leader would weigh in as we as a district develop how we outline the steps to work with families when students have high absences. Your concern is um, a different process that okay. falls under. I thought I was getting to the root of some kind of. You, we are. Here, but um, no. We've already dug into the other situation. Okay, so, um, but I do think this, the nurse leader being a piece of supporting families where there may be medical situations. Um, I think sometimes families aren't even aware of the extent of support that children with medical issues can get in schools, so they're concerned about having kids, you know, they're, they're worried about their kids, of course, so I just don't think they realize the level of skill that school nurses have. I mean, they're RNs and highly educated and experienced, so. Member Martini, go ahead. Uh, not the same, but maybe sort of um, related to Elizabeth's um, concerns. It has been difficult at times to keep it straight, what the expectations are, what the protocols are for when to keep your child home or when not to. And that is difficult for um, parents of children who have medical issues or who are often sick and that might keep them out of school because of really stringent COVID-related protocols, but they're trying to maximize their child's yeah. time in school. So having conflicting or confusing information makes that really difficult. So, so this person is going to be then in charge of making sure that those 
attendance protocols related to that are clear and consistent and implemented the same way by all of the nurses and other staff and yes, what have you. Well, the nurses, you know, okay. and the nurse leader would collaborate with building administrators to ensure everyone understands what the rules are and would work with the Department of Public Health around any restrictions, um, things like that. But yes, they would be the coordinator of that information. They would guide what steps are put into place and then work with building administrators to push that information out to families. So it's really important that we have one hub of information related to medical. So I see this person as serving that role. Where will they be located? That's probably the hardest question you've asked me yet. <laughs> um, I do not yet know. I was just hopeful that we could get to the posting of the job part and then we will go hunting for space. <laughs> okay. Um, Pro probably not in Four Corners nurse's office. Absolutely not. There's barely room for Ellis, <laughs> for Ellis. in the nurse's office. Yes. So. Uh, do you anticipate um, having to draw from anything else in order to fund this position? And if so, what? Well, um, sort of. What we're looking to do for the next two years is to utilize some of the ESER funding to provide this. And we are looking to be able to do that because we got the DESE grants for the instructional materials and we had identified, that was too close, we had identified a particular amount of money to be available for the CKLA purchase and that was offset so we're reallocating to provide a resource. At the time we wrote the grants originally, the conversations about a full-time nurse leader hadn't been had yet. So um, given that we got the grant opportunity, I felt like it was a good way to reallocate those funds. But at some point, we'll have to look to get it into the local. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, one of the pieces I would prioritize of getting into the local. Other questions or comments? I think we're ready to vote. So again, we're voting on approving the job description for the nurse leader. Are there any abstentions from this vote? Any no votes? So that passes unanimously. Good thank discussion. You. Yes, thank you. And we'll go on. We've got two items of surplus materials. We'll start with the technology items. There are lists in the packet of technology and the books is the next item. Are the lists in the packet or were they online? Online. Because oh, they're sorry. rather extensive. I have, I have some, yeah, okay, I have two packets, so. Um, okay, so for the technology uh, motion, I move to declare as surplus the GPS technology as inventoried on the spring 2022 IT equipment recycling master list. Do we have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Member Martini was the second. And any discussion? So it sounds like we're ready to vote. As, are there any abstentions from voting? Any no votes? So the surplus passes unanimously. Thank you. Perfect. We'll move on to the books. I'll do a motion. Uh, I move to declare as surplus the GPS library materials as inventoried on the Greenfield High School Library weeding log dated 8-1-2021 to 6-5-2022. So moved. And a second? Second. A second from uh, Vice Chair Wall. Uh, any discussion of this? My only question was, is this is just specifically stuff from Greenfield High School? Yes, it's just the high school. And then included on the book inventory i noticed there was also technology there were laptops or something that were on the list wait i have it thank you <laughs> i brought it with me i bet it's on here yeah look at you library reading log near the end yeah at the end there's 
um, laptop, three, four, five, yeah. 15 removed laptops. So. I would anticipate that those are also reflected on the IT okay. inventory. So if okay. you'd like to, what we can do is just exclude the vote on those 15 library laptops until I can confirm if they're additional and they are beyond repair or end of life, we can bring them back. The, and the numbers all matched, like said there was 15, there actually were 15. They all appear to be unique, you know. Um, I, I'm sure that yeah. Mrs. Pollock counted the, yeah. I'm just um, anticipating that our IT staff inventoried yeah. them as well. So if the committee doesn't mind, I would say exclude those 15 library laptops from the vote to, invent, okay. to um, declare surplus. If in fact they are 15 unique devices, I can bring those back to the committee with the next batch of technology uh, or, or library surplus. Okay. Yeah. Does that work for everyone? Does, is that okay? I'm just wondering if there's a way we can, yeah, somehow make it so, no, not amend it, but just do it so that you don't have to bring it back to us. We're going to want to declare them surplus either way. I, I'm wondering, can we just um, ask that it be confirmed that um, they are appropriately reflected for IT since they're listed in library yes. and as long as that is okay and we vote unan or we vote to approve it, they then just we're good in. either way Does absolutely that, work? that works for everybody okay okay thank you sure thank you thank you Glenn uh, yeah go ahead member Martini I had one question I noticed on the list of I know in in the weeding of the library materials, we're getting rid of outdated things, which makes sense. I noticed that there were a fair few books on there that were acquired very recently, um, and it looks as though they were checked out by a student who never returned it. So what what do we do about that? Does that mean we're not replacing it, and therefore it's on the list as being weeded out, or what does that mean? There are some materials at the high school that are being taken off the inventory, so it's being weeded from the collection. It's not necessarily being, like some of them are actually listed because they're available to be checked out from other libraries by our students, but they're not really available anymore, so she wants to take them off of the list as being available. So that's... That would be great. I'm going to send this book to, to Jessica Pollock oh, and yes. see if she Please. shelves it somewhere for us. <laughs> but um, this does not reflect the purchase of any new materials. So if this book was not returned, it, she probably did buy a new one. She certainly could. It wouldn't be reflected in this. No, I'm not going to. Sounds, it sounds like the executive session minutes here. <laughs> Any further discussion about the book inventory and the, and the surplus? Okay, we'll move to a vote. Any no votes? Any abstentions? So that passes unanimously with the understanding I'll about the fix IT. the technology, yeah. yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And we now have the item 12, which is... Um, the cell phone practices, Greenfield Middle School and Greenfield High School, specifically for the upcoming academic year. Go ahead. So we identified, as I'm sure all of you did as well, that the use of cell phones, particularly by students at the secondary, has become a substantial impediment to improved student learning. Um, like they do when they're not in school. Students use them for some productive reasons, but also for some very disruptive reasons. And um, it was brought to Derek at the high school by um, some of his leadership team that they really felt we needed to do something to address the cell phones. It is, to be very pragmatic, impossible to chase 500 students daily to put phones away. Not only is it physically impossible, it is 
a waste of valuable instructional time to ask our highly skilled instructional staff, teachers, and IAs to continually engage with students around phones. Um, there is a product out that is the vendor that we have reached out to is called Yonder. They are pouches that students put cell phones into at the beginning of a day. The pouch is secured and the students are unable to get their phones out of the pouch during the instructional day. Um, Derek and I went to Chicopee High School who adopted the use of these pouches midway through the past instruction, the, midway through the past academic year um, due to those exact types of things. The amount of time wasted from instruction for students who are distracted on their phones, the numbers of um, social media incidents that occur during the course of a school day, just the disruption and lack of attention paid to instruction during the day. So we went to Chicopee High to watch the process, to see the materials, to see how the, the students entered the building, and it was an extremely smooth process. You all have a picture, you have the little handout. Um, it's basically a pouch about this big. They have some that come in two sizes for smaller phones and bigger phones. Students are assigned individual pouches. Um, in the district we visited, students were able to decorate their pouch and, and whatever. Um, they have them during the course of the day and as they exit the building at the end of the day, it's they walk by a device. I'm likening it. It's basically yeah. like they demagnetize it. Yep. Yeah. They basically demagnetize it at the end of the day. They take their phone out, put the pouch away, and they go on their way. So the phones are not damaged by the pouch. They are not in the school's possession during the course of the day. Students retain possession of their phone unless as they would any other time they need a consequence regarding phones. There may be a time when they're um, held in the office until a parent comes in potentially. But as a typical course of action, the students retain possession of their phone throughout the day. And um, there was a very positive response at the high school that we visited. And there are multiple other districts that are moving to utilizing those in the fall. Um, I don't know if any of you saw, but um, Central High School in Springfield, there was an article written up about them using them. Um, some other districts, I know that Comp, also in Chicopee, is looking to move to the same that Chicopee High has done. Derek and I had the opportunity to meet with the school administrator to talk about the pros and cons. And um, we feel that it's extremely important to try to be responsive to the concerns that were raised. We, as you folks very well know, had a lot of disruptive behavior this year, especially at the beginning of the year with students. And a lot of that was connected to the availability of phones during the day. So, um, we also need to improve access to education for our students. That's why they're in our buildings during the day. And if they are distracted or on their phones all day long, they're not getting the benefit of being in front of highly qualified instructors during the day. So um, that is what we are looking to do. I did um, reach out to the acting police chief and to um, State Trooper Carmichael, and they, you have a letter from the acting police chief in support of the use of these. Um, Trooper Carmichael said he is aware of the pouches, highly supports their use. I understand that one of the concerns would be regarding safety. So I will say there are teacher pouches that we have, um, that would be available. They're Velcroed. So the adults in the room can get to a phone in a second if needed. We also have phones on the walls in the rooms that are able to call out. So um, that's so old school. It, but but it works. Um, so and really, in the case of an actual 
emergency, a serious situation that could be occurring in a building, what we need is our students to be listening to the directions of the adults in this space where they are and implementing our security protocols. That is the most important thing. We teach our students to be low and quiet in the case of an emergency. And um, you know the concern, the statement identified by um, Acting Chief Gordon and in some of the other materials that I've shared is that when students are worried about their phones, they're not listening to the people that are trying to help keep them safe in the environment. So I understand, I have a child in high school, I understand the concerns, but I also understand that um, we need to redirect the attention of our students to attending to what's happening in their environment instructionally first. That's a good overview, thank you. Sure. Um, so we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. In terms of the school committee piece of this, um, the, the way that I see it is we're really needing to do um, two pieces, two motions perhaps for this. Um, I, the actual implementation of this tool I see as it's very operational. It's not really about the school committee. The administration has said this is an important thing for uh, social emotional um, uh, improvements and for learning loss and we need to support that. So the first thing is we don't have a policy about cell phones at all in our policies. So the first motion would be basically to say let's charge the policy subcommittee with creating a policy that supports and complements what the administration is trying to do with implementing this program. Um, and then the second piece I'd like to try to do in terms of a motion is just to say we've, we've heard this out, we um, uh, have all our questions answered, and we support the administration moving forward with this, just kind of a motion of support. Um, and we can discuss those in either order. And I think it, it, if folks are okay with it, before we do either motion or before we do a motion, do you just wanna talk about this? Cause it's a lot to, to kind of digest and I'm sure you have questions. So we'll have a general discussion first. Who, anyone who would like to ask questions or make comments? Member Johnson, we said, go ahead. Um, I guess, it's a very big change, and I think it. I think I'm hearing the reading and hearing the arguments in favor of it. I. I don't know if there may be others in the community or in. In other settings, who have differing opinions, and I guess I'm just I'm curious, what you, superintendent, see as possible uh, downsides to this new policy or possible unintended negative consequences, and I'm interested to know if you've had a chance to discuss this with uh, equity, folks thinking about equity in the district um, in terms of what impacts it could have in terms of equity. So a few things that um, administratively we know that need to be addressed, and we already have um, plans in the works to address some things is first, we know there's been some comments prior um, about some challenges with phones in offices. So um, Mike with IT and I actually met with our telephone representative and talked about ways that the telephone systems can be reprogrammed to make it somewhat easier for staff to answer them. We can do, I, it's not the official term, I call it make the phone bounce if it's unanswered after so many rings. I know there's a term for it, but um, so there are ways that we can reprogram to make it easier so that families who need to call the school in case there is a situation where, mm. you know, a parent can't pick up a child who was expecting a ride, things along those lines, they'd be able to get a message to the school in a timely manner. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about the safety issue. That's, I think that's a, a big 
concern that families would have, but again, we do have ways to communicate with, with first responders um, through the adult phones and classroom phones, building phones, um, so there are ways to communicate about that. Um, we would have a parent night. We have a tentative parent information night scheduled August 8th because we know there will be questions about how it works, what happens with the phones, all of that. Um, and um, the, the one piece that, you know, when we, we brought this, um, we've talked with several groups, you mentioned the equity folks. The one piece that they um, wondered about is would students have some difficulty separating from their phone? And I'm sure they would. But I think, to be truthful, that's part of the problem that we're seeing in school is they can't separate from their phone. They, there's no um, or very little boundary or um, ability to separate access to the phone when they should be accessing instruction. Um, so, you know, there is language in the handbook that phones aren't supposed to be used in classrooms, and that is not, um, it's operationally not able to be enforced. It's just too rampant. Um, and we would do nothing all day except redirect students from the phone. I think oh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, that was my issue or my question around uh, <laughs> withdrawal, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> phone withdrawal. Um, I'm sure it'll happen. I'm sure it'll be something that you'll figure out how to navigate. Uh, but you're exactly right, the, mm -hmm. the, the reason that they're not being able to pay attention to learning is because they can't get off their telephones. I, um, in the mid-20s, 2000s rather, uh, 2010, 11, 12, 13, um, in my previous lifetime as a corporate instructor, um, had, and that was sort of when iPhones really became very popular handheld, uh, not flip phones, but you know, the ones that would do everything, like make dinner reservations and stuff. I was teaching adults, sort of. They were 20-year-olds, 20, 20 to 30-year-olds. And it was my first experience with classrooms, because I'd been doing corporate training for a number of years. <clears throat> classrooms that uh, just simply weren't paying any attention, and what they were learning were skills as to how to, how to do their job wasn't, you know, math is boring, blah, blah, blah. These were, in order to maintain your job, you have to do this. And it was, it was so frustrating. And I was like, I, after the first time it happened, I said, wow, it, I need to be able to require them not to bring their phones into the class or to have a, you know, a, a box or something. And I was basically told I couldn't do that by the client, you know. So it was a it was a difficult period uh, to get them to do things other than make movie reserva you know dinner reservations and chat with their friends and all of that. One of the ways that um, you know in speaking with the representative who's worked with a number of of districts and even with private organizations who've utilized this for events as well, requiring their attendees to put their phones in the pouch prior to entering the, the event. Um, one of the things that was recommended is that we wait until um, like the second or third week of school so that we could prepare students, talk about what things would look like, um, help talk through some of their questions and concerns and get them ready for what the environment would look like with the change. Um, and it would also give time for the year to begin somewhat and for us to set some classroom routines um, without worrying about dealing with the phone situation, but to start to establish relationships with kids and give them you know, some time to think about how this would look in their classrooms and then move to doing that. 
we would also have the ability to have representatives in the buildings for the initial few days when this was rolled out um, to help staff, to help students get used to it, to do any problem solving. So um, it made sense to sort of um, give students an opportunity to talk about their concerns and, and to hear them. I, I do agree with what you said. I think it's a period of withdrawal. Um, so it's fair that they may react to it, but that addiction to use the, I don't know if it's clinically appropriate, but the, the social um, draw to be on the phone all the time, I think is exactly what proves that this is a warranted direction. Member Johnson, we saw it on the member Neneve. Well, just to, I mean, talk about that. They are designed to be addictive. You know, the, the smartest minds of our generation went into figuring out how to make these devices incredibly addictive for young people and for adults. I wonder if school committee members can be provided with a bag as well. <laughs> um, and, um, and that it is, it is very concerning in, in that way. So I guess I just wanted to, to say that, that they, the pub, the kind of like the, the, and then the, the social media apps that are put on these phones, you know, there is, there are some indications, although the social media companies won't give us access to the data to really be able to show it, but it seems that in particular for young girls, the effect on self-esteem and um, body image and so on has been extremely uh, damaging. So there are definitely equity issues involved in leaving the phones in people's hands as well. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just personally in a place of feeling like I, if I was asked to support tonight, I probably would abstain just because I feel like I need a little more time to read or learn about it um, before before voicing support. It's uh, the arguments are sound strong to me, but um, I just want to make sure that I get a chance to listen to and read some other voices before vo voicing support or not voicing support. So this kept me busy, like this bothered me all day. I read this and I just like couldn't for the rest of the day. Um, I'm one of the- Can you tell us what you were holding up? The uh, thing from the chief. Okay, not, I mean, I can tell what you're holding up. Yeah. So people know what you're holding up. I don't even know where to start because I'm one of the dissenting voices and my child doesn't even have a phone. But um, I think that this is, this isn't where you start. Like you start with teaching self-discipline and I think that phones are gonna be with us forever. We've given them to the children. They are addictive. Are we teaching them how to deal with that addiction? We're just locking them up. Fine, I agree with that. I agree that they are a nuisance and that they're interfering with education. I got it. But this article from the Washington Post it's just one voice. I, I could Google and instantly find opposing views on this in a second. And there are all kinds of security experts that say that these kinds of pouches are security theater, are part of the billions of dollars that are made every year on security apparatus to make our schools safer. And I just think that we need to pull the parents, have a parent forum, talk to the parents, talk to the public how they feel about this, see if there are other avenues that we can also explore regarding teaching self-discipline, regarding um, creating policies. I think that just putting them in a pouch is, and calling it done is not appropriate. And I think that you're gonna have parents who are gonna choice out because of this. I would choice out because of this. I can't get a hold of the school. I don't feel like I have enough communication ways with the school. I don't feel safe. So I know there's other parents that feel this way. They don't pick up the phone when you call. So parents feel that this is what they need to do in order to have a lifeline to their child. You know, so until we're also fixing that problem, this is not a problem that should come up right away, I don't think. We're like just doing one avenue. 
but there's this whole thing that needs to be fixed. And I, for one, don't feel any safer with this, or I don't feel like my security concerns or my communication concerns are being addressed with this at all. And as a parent, I would be like, well, this, you know, clearly they're not taking a well-rounded approach on this issue, and this would cause me to school choice out. And you're going to find other parents that feel the same way. And I think they should be polled, and there should be a forum. So I don't think we should decide on this tonight. Member Martini, go ahead. I, um, I think that probably all of us have encountered, as time has gone on, the fracturing of our attention by not just cell phones, but kind of the way modern technology is. Um, I am certainly no exception, uh, so I feel that in my own brain. Um, and I really feel the need to keep that from detracting from our students' ability to engage in the classroom. Um, and I really, really feel for any teacher who is spending too much time enforcing rules um, and who doesn't have enough support um, from others and from other means to focus on teaching. Uh, and I know that that has been a huge issue for a lot of our staff this past year um, and something that really needs to be um, addressed in a comprehensive way. That being said, I also know that uh, many of our students and many of our parents have had concerns about serious bullying and aggression and inappropriate um, verbal behavior as well directed at their own student. Um, and I can't say that I would feel comfortable with my child not having the ability to reach me. Um, I understand that the district doesn't want students recording things, but that being said, um, there are a number of incidents in other school districts that have only come to light because a student was recording something on their cell phone when they were being bullied or when they were being mistreated by a member of the staff. So uh, I don't feel that I could make a vote in support of this without having input from parents in particular in the district, and I, I wouldn't be able to do that tonight. Of course. So I want to make clear, um, I'm, I'm not sure I understood one of your points, Elizabeth. The, um, the pouches for the cell phones are not intended to be a safety measure. So I want to make sure that I didn't um, misspeak when I was talking about them. They are not a safety measure. I know that there would be questions raised about the ability to contact first responders in case of an emergency. So I wanted to share that there is, um, there are negatives to having a flood of cell phone calls to first responders in those situations and that we do have other ways for that to occur. So these are not, cons I do not consider these to be a safety measure. Um, I shared that we are looking at ways to address the phone issue. Um, so. I've heard you share that previously, so that is something that's already being addressed. Um, we are approaching the issue of, I'll use your phrase, self-control in, in, in other ways um, that will be part of our social-emotional curriculum, self-management ways to think before you respond, ways to consider the perceptions of others before you say or do something. Um, but that does not come quickly, nor will it come with one year of SEL work. Um, the challenge with dealing 
with adolescents is that self-control is not one of their best qualities generally. They um, just by virtue of development are not well self-controlled at all times. And the result of that is behavior that is exceptionally inappropriate, not just on the telephone or using the phone as the means to do some of the things, Kate, that you referenced, um, but they are also verbally abusive and profane at times to the adults in the environment who try to address the phones. And um, I don't disagree, Kate, that there is negative behavior and at times documented cases of bullying and students can call parents from office phones, from the nurse's office, from the guidance counselors. And I would certainly want students to be accessing those people if they are being treated in a way that is impacting them in a negative way. So there are ways to contact families for our students. Um, this isn't about recording anything. This is about the fact that our kids are not learning. They are not paying attention in class. They are not in class because they're texting each other to meet in hallways. You folks heard about all of the safety issues families were talking about at the start of this year. And our staff is asking that we look to address cell phones as one of the ways to intervene around the behavior that we heard about so clearly at the start of the year. So administratively, we are trying to respond to that and we have substantial academic needs in the district. We have attendance needs and we have needs to address student behavior and when we talk about factors that impact all of that, one common denominator is phones. So um, I appreciate that parents may not love this idea, but we are charged administratively with instructing the students while they're here during the day. And it is in our handbook that they're not to use the phones during class time. So the presence of that language has done nothing to impact student behavior, nothing. Um, so I am, um, I appreciate that families may have some concern, but they also had a lot of concern about the issues we were dealing with at the start of the year. So I am somewhat um, perplexed as to how we are to address all of the issues that we were hearing about if we are not able to take some fairly drastic steps to change the environment. So. I saw a member Martini and then a member, a member Wall. What's the cost? The initial startup is 16,000 and that's for um, enough students for middle school and high school and some extra pouches in case students forget them at home, lose them, whatever. Um, and then the recurring cost is about 12. 12,000 per year? Yes, well it's per student. The recurring cost is per student. So it could ebb and flow a little bit based on student count, but that's about what the um, cost would be, yes. Member Wall, go ahead. I wondered from a practical standpoint, when a person comes into school, they put their phone into the pouch and it's locked automatically. Is that correct? They have to um, snap it closed, but then it's secured, yes. 
And whenever they leave school, it unlocks. They walk by a T. So if, if, it's, it's a way to get it out, yes. So if I had to go outside because the building was on fire, my phone would unlock as I went out the door? No, we would have to take the, um, it's a small mounted, basically it looks like a magnetic disc. Um, the students have to pass the locking mechanism over that for but, it to unlock. But, but they would be skilled in doing that as they were leaving. Oh, yes. I will tell you the school that we visited, students were very, they said that they, they dismiss a school um, larger than ours in seven minutes. So if, say, there's a snow emergency, would the, is there a, a time that it will unlock, or is it just when you're leaving the building? You it's can... when you go past the fob, I'll call it, the okay. demagnetization de or the, the, locking, the unlocking device. Um, but they are not permanently mounted in the building, so if there were a reason that we needed to evacuate a building, those can be taken outside of the building and we can take care of phones at that time. So if the child is outside for some reason, one can assume that their phone is out of the pouch if they have taken the precautions to do that. They would have to walk by one of the devices. If they went out a door where there was no adult who had one, for example, if they were choosing to leave school um, unauthorized during the course of a day through a, a different door, they would likely be doing so with a phone in a pouch. <laughs> but if they're going out authorized, we'll have the ability to have everybody's phones out of the pouch. Okay, so I worry equally as much about those children. We have Every child in the school is getting a free lunch because the income level of the families here is so low. And I worry more about the children who are being bullied because they can't afford a phone or are put in the position of needing to get a phone to keep up with their cohorts when their families can't afford it. So taking away the phones when you're in school it appears to me would solve a lot of those problems. And uh, to me, the, the person who is uh, more likely to bully would be the person with a phone instead of the person without a phone. So I would definitely support this. I think that having our children learn is much more important than teaching them uh, through uh, other means how to control their addictions, that this is just a fast way to teach children you can't always have everything at, when you want it, that you have, to, you have to go for the good of the community, not for the good of the individual. Uh, Secretary Extra, go ahead. I actually just have a practical question because as I'm sitting here, I'm not looking at my phone. I have someone texting me on my watch that it's feeding through to my watch. So is it that when the phone goes in there, it does more than just keep it locked in? Or is it that if someone has an eye watch or whatever kind of watch you're wearing, that they would still be able to see what's going on? I the signal won't go to the watch. Thank you. Member Deneuve, go ahead. These, these things can also be easily hacked. I mean, I, there's so many there's so many other things that can occur, and there are so many other voices on this. And this is a national topic. There's a lot of people writing about this. There are so many other ways. And I just want to say that since I've been here, I've noticed this school district is hard. It hardens itself, and there are other options. And getting harder isn't always the right one. And I know that. That's radical thinking for some, but making it even more locked down is not always the right choice. That's all I want to say, but I totally can't support this. Other comments or questions? 
I wonder, so I guess procedurally, is this, um, you're asking for our support, but this is within your purview as superintendent. I mean, is this something that you would go forward on whether we voted in support tonight or not? I guess that's my question. I believe it is an operational issue. Um, I would prefer to move forward with school committee support. If you have questions that I can get answers for, I am very happy to do that. Um, I do think that it's important to think about balancing um, opinion with the operational needs that we have within the school on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, so, again, we've, we've struggled with what the options are. And to be truthful, I think we will be able to be much more restorative and open to having relationships with students if they're attending to what's happening in front of them and available to have an actual conversation with somebody instead of being um, on the phone all the time. So um, it's, it's a significant change. I understand that. I agree with that. But um, for people who were day to day in the classrooms combating the use of phones and the behaviors associated with phone use, um, they've, they've tried a lot of things. It's not like no one tried redirecting students or no one tried giving consequences for phone use. That is not a way to build relationships with kids to continually be in a <clears throat> confrontational situation with them day in and day out over phones. So um, I, I am happy to have conversation and answer questions. Um, but I'm, I'm not necessarily under the belief that all families in the district will gravitate toward this idea, but I also know that all the parents in this district want their kids to be productive, to be learners, to be um, comfortable during school, and to not worry about um, the phones and what's happening in a social way that they're drawn to during the course of the school day. Secretary Extra? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I don't know if, if you already spoke to this, but is it, can you talk a little bit about the difference, so for example, in Chicopee, pre-doing the packets and post-doing packets, classroom communication, how, um, learning change, things like that? I can only tell you what was shared in the conversation that Derek and I had with staff on site, is that they definitely feel that students were more engaged during the day. They um, saw less of the cell phone driven behavioral issues, the you know meeting up in the hallway, the, those types of things. Um, there are certainly situations, there are students who, you know, vandalize the pouches and are, you know, still have other behavioral issues, so it's not a perfect situation. Um, but they did see, say that they saw much more um, improvement in engagement in the classroom. They did say that the um, concerns raised by parents was um, present for the first week or two, and after that, there was no more concern raised, and they started this, the use of these, partway through the school year. So they had um, a fair amount of the academic year that had already passed before this was instituted there. So, um, you know, they were very pleased with it, and to the point that the other high school in the city is moving to adopting it. Other questions or comments? I saw uh, Jean's hand first and then Member Johnson was said. Uh, 
I wonder if it would be uh, practical to delay the vote until August so that those who feel that they need more time to think about it would have that opportunity and parents would be able to come and talk to us if they feel strongly. Do you want to? No, go ahead. Um, I'm going to answer it, but I'm going to let Glenn speak first. How about that? Well, that was my exact question. So Jean and I on the same, same question. Way. Yeah, I think a, I so, think a month to because I mean this this letter is dated July 11th. Today's July 13th, and I just feel like you all have had a lot of time to think about and process this and kind of come to this conclusion that this is what's best for the district. And I need time uh, to learn more, to listen to people in the community, and. Uh, before I, I, I feel that the arguments are strong, I have to be honest, um, but, and I, I think that it's not an ideal world at all. I, I think uh, in a different world there would be resources where students would have more help and more resource from adults, but these, are, but these teachers are managing classrooms in situations that are already unworkable in terms of the numbers of students per class because of how our country does not invest in education the way it should. So I kind of see that it might be a necessary measure, even though I, it kind of rubs me the wrong way, but I would like some more time to think and read and listen to people about it. Other questions, comments? I guess what I would say about this is just to outline my approach when um, when this it was brought to me by the superintendent, um, you're my witness. The first thing I said was, we got to address the phone issues in the main office. I know that's going to be a problem. That was the first thing I said. And mostly I listened because our role as the school committee is to hire the superintendent to make the decisions about uh, learning environments and social emotional uh, environments and um, all of the pieces that go along with those being successful and with improving the district. Christine has an incredible level of education and experience around these issues none of us individually or collectively do. And that isn't our role. Our role is to create policy and priori priorities that allow us to uh, make the decisions around our spending and around our um, procedures that run a, a, a district uh, effectively and in a way that our students can learn. This is without question, a decision that can be made by the superintendent to say, we're going to use this tool because we need to um, manage these pieces better and this will be a very effective tool. And I trust that when our staff, our teachers, our, our administrators are all saying, this needs to be addressed and our administrators go out and find a solution and research a solution that will address it. We are duty bound to work with them to support what they are doing as the experts in the situation. And that is how I approach this decision. The second piece I would add, these will be in every school district within three years. So, I mean, they can choice wherever, they're gonna choice to a place that also is using a tool like this. That's all I have to say. Um, so, uh, further discussion at this time. Member Johnson, we saw, go ahead. I guess it's, you know, I think it's maybe partly it's the way it's being framed. I mean, Superintendent, if you came, gave us as part of your report, like, I'm going to be doing this and this is the explanation these are the reasons i mean i'm very supportive of you and your judgment and what you want i feel that for this to be different than just a rubber stamp if you want us to 
to vote to support it and actually feel knowledgeable enough and have had enough time to think about it. It's a longer process than just coming to one meeting and giving us the, the arguments in favor um, before I feel comfortable to make that vote. So I guess I'd probably abstain, but I don't want my abstain vote of support to, to mean I don't support you and what you're trying to do. I really think that what you're trying to address is important and I would love to hear directly from some of the, the teachers about the issue and whether what their thoughts are about this, you know, as an approach. So um, I'm going to interrupt you just very gently oh, okay. to remind you that hearing from teachers isn't our role. That's the superintendent's role. Okay, but we're getting a report that we're supposed to sign on to this because the teachers want it. The teachers are asking for it. They want, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is it's powerful for me to hear directly from the people instead of kind of hearing report that this is what they're asking for. So school committee policies very clearly identifies that the teaching staff, the staff in the district report to the superintendent and that it's my role to bring their feedback and concerns to the committee. So, um, so I would assume that you would trust that that's an accurate representation. So if that's, um, if you're feeling differently than that, then I guess that's a, a different conversation that we could certainly have. Um, I appreciate this isn't an easy discussion and it's a, it's a big undertaking. So um, I, I guess um, it's an interesting perspective you raise where it might have been different if I had just said as part of the report, hey, guess what we're doing? Um, so I um, wanted to have the discussion and, and hope that the committee would support what is you know, a pretty significant change. Um, so I appreciate that perspective. I was feeling that I was being respectful of the committee's role and, and you're giving me a different perspective. So that's interesting. Um, I think that, um, you know, if, if you have questions, I am very happy to get additional information for you. I respect that you have not had as much time to process this. Um, as I have, as, as Derek and Michelle have had. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I'm very happy to hear questions and to get information to bring back to the committee to send it to you if you would like, whatever the, whatever the next step is that you would like. Um, but so, can I interrupt? I'm of sorry. Course. It, perhaps we could do one motion tonight to just uh, charge the policy subcommittee with working on a cell phone policy that would complement having a tool like this in place. And we can vote on the other piece that seems to be so contentious next month. I'm looking for any any sort of is that here? Is that do you feel a need for a cell phone policy from the school committee? No, honestly. And I'll let you answer too, no. I'm sorry. I, I honestly do not. I believe actually more than I probably said already that this is an operational decision. This is something the superintendent has said we're going to do because we need to do it. And I feel it's important that we partner as much as possible with our administration. And so it makes sense that because our tools are budget and policy that we would put a policy in place. And from my perspective, um, you don't care. Well, interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, somewhat it it would help me, I think, because it would speak to the committee's belief about how um, what you believe philosophically for the district. And if the committee were to say, no, we don't think phones should be something that's used day to day in the school building by students then this would have been an update for you in my report because I would say I'm responsible for implementing your policy and this is how it's being implemented. But right now, there is no such thing. What I think would be a very good conversation at the policy subcommittee level is 
what do you believe? Because if the committee as a whole does not believe or believes that cell phones should be allowed in the classrooms, I would be expecting quite a bit of conversation about operational um, challenges with that. There would be no way for use, very little way for use to be restricted during instructional time, if that's the case. So I think a belief statement by this committee is important for the administrators. Thank you. Secretary Extra. I actually have a question. So we, um, we approved the student handbook, yes? And in the student handbook, it says cell phone use or something to the effect of cell phone use would not be permitted during, permitted during the school day. I think it's not school day. <laughs> okay. And so, in my thinking, if that's if that is there for me, and I understand your need to have a policy for it, and I understand the the framework for it. For me, that's already there, and this is the way that you are choosing to meet that need. So. Just my thought. Thank you for that. Other questions or discussion? Member Nadine and then Member Martini. I, it's not that I don't support you wanting to restrict cell phones, but are we not also as a school committee the bridge between the public and the administration? So we should take time to find out what parents feel about this. We should poll them, we should survey them, we should give time for public comment. I think that that's important. I mean, that's just based on what I've read. We ha I mean, this is something that inc it directly involves parents and their interactions with their children at school in case of emergencies or bullying situations. I mean, I think we're going to hear a lot of arguments for and against, and I think we need some time to be open to that, to hear all these perspectives. So that's why I totally support pushing it until at least August and give people a chance to voice their feelings about it because it's not a black and white issue. And it does affect equality, and uh, that's something that I think we should discuss more in depth. I think um, there are a lot of good reasons to do this, and there's a strong argument to be made for it. Um, and I definitely want to support our superintendent in being successful um, in her job. I also think that big changes like this do require input from the committee and the community. Um, if all the committee's job is to do is to pick a superintendent and then support them in everything 100% regardless of what is on the table, then I kind of wonder what's the point of a school committee existing after the selection of a superintendent. Um, and I wholeheartedly respect the superintendent's role in running the district operationally. Um, and I also don't think that big decisions should be made with no opportunity for input from parents. The school district asks parents to literally give you our most precious thing, which is our children. So um, I think that parents should have an opportunity to have uh, a say about significant things, which this is. Uh, so I would really like to have a delay here so that people have the opportunity to share their views with us. When you say delay, what do you mean? And I mean that in the kindest way. What sort of delay are we talking about? A delay on what? Can we um, table this discussion till the next school committee meeting so that people who are watching tonight or who follow up um, about this meeting then have a few weeks to no, let us know, email us, call us, let us know how they feel about this particular issue and to show up to public comment. I understand that, I do, and I'm hearing that loud and clear that you all are interested in having more time to get more feedback. 
Um, and I hear, I've heard a couple of times that this is considered a big decision, a big deal. And perhaps that's where I would disagree with that assessment. I don't think this is a big deal. I think that it is a way to help to, um, it's a tool like a lot of other tools that we have that will help to improve the learning environment. Um, and I, I just don't, I, I guess I, I'm missing why it is such a big deal, but I respect that folks want more time and I've heard that loud and clear. Um, it looks like, uh, Vice Chair Wall, go ahead. Yeah. I propose that we do send it to the uh, policy committee and have, a, have them discuss whether they want children to be allowed to have phones in the classroom. I mean, I think that's what it all boils down to is should your child be allowed to be on the phone in the classroom? And if the answer is no, come back with a solution that beats this one or whatever, but I think that that is the question. Do we want the children to have a phone that they are using while they're in the classroom? Well, yeah, agreed. Uh, Member Martini, go ahead. Uh, respectfully, I don't think that's actually the question. I think we're all pretty much in agreement that having unfettered access to cell phones in the classroom is distracting and not a good thing uh, for our kids. And I'm pretty sure there would be mostly unanimous um, you know, views about that amongst parents in the community. I think the question is about what is our approach as a district to that problem? And it's not just that problem, because there are other things in the student handbook um, that are related to this in my mind. Um, such as lax enforcement of mask rules when we had them, um, what the administrative support is for teachers when they are experiencing behavioral difficulties with a student in the classroom. If there's a student who is um, not complying with anything in the student handbook, are we responding adequately to support our teachers? And uh, cell phones, I guess, are, Maybe they're low-hanging fruit in that because there's, a, there's this easy way to externally control that, but that's not the case for other things. And um, it also goes to the committee's responsibilities when it comes to the district budget because we have to talk about what the best use of funds is. And I think that it's not necessarily a choice between having um, no response to student behavioral issues like with the cell phones or clamping down and controlling them in a, um, what was that word you said, <laughs> Elizabeth? Security theater? Uh, oh, well, I don't know if it was that one, but. Um, I wonder if there are options for the district to invest in um, such as non-adversarial behavior intervention that we could create a team available to teachers when they need it in the classroom um, so that we're not destroying relationships but also not, um, not being so authoritarian. That's not a question that can like be answered right now but um, this is why I feel like there needs to be more time, there needs to be more discussion, and there needs to be an opportunity for um, input from the community. So I'm all for having a policy, but I, I don't feel okay. like that would answer the question. Okay, I, I'm going to um, end discussion at this point. I'm not hearing anything new at this point from folks. Uh, what I would like to try to do is one of the two motions that I had uh, outlined. Um, and so I would like a motion to uh, charge the policy subcommittee with creating a cell phone policy for the Greenfield Public Schools to support administrative efforts toward improving the learning environment for and social emotional well-being of our students. So moved. 
And a second? Second. And specific to ask, charging the policy subcommittee, we can have discussion or questions. Anyone? We're ready to go to a vote? Okay, so um, any abstentions from moving this to the policy subcommittee? Any no votes? Okay, so that passes unanimously. We're gonna work on a policy. Um, the, we'll put that to the subcommittee. Thank you for that. And in terms of the other piece that I had hoped to move forward, which is a, a show of support through just a motion um, from the school committee that we are supporting this decision by the superintendent. We can wait on that. I wanna make really clear that the, the administration does not need to wait on moving forward with the purchase. All we would be doing is showing support for that. I don't want us to be in a position where the, the priorities and, and direction of the superintendent differ from the school committee, so I hope that you truly do just need more time to get to a place where we can, we can approve this. Um, and uh, I, I, I would hope that, yeah, I, I don't want to be in a position where we can't endorse something that I think is an effective tool. So I would leave it at that. Did, one more comment? Sure. I just a question. Do you want there to be a timeline? No. Which the policy committee would work? I, I, have, I have seen enough with the chair, uh, uh, Johnson Musad, to know that this will get undertaken efficiently and swiftly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a good discussion. Um, I appreciate everyone's uh, passion around the issue, for sure. Okay. Sorry about that. We're gonna, we, yes, we do have just a, a couple more items. Um, we are asking for a, a quick recess. Let's, uh, it is 8.06, let's come back at 8.15. And on the agenda since the, no, it was too. It it, it 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 was it was brought separately. Yeah, yeah. So we're um, moving into the uh, last item on the agenda before executive session: the superintendent's evaluation. This is an annual process. Um, superintendent DeBarge started in August of of 2021. This is an appropriate timeline to, in which to measure um, and evaluate. So everyone has this packet in front of them and uh, there's you're going to just present a little bit mm -hmm. and then the process um, you're going to take this back with you at the tail end of it uh, you have a tool that you as a school committee member will complete based on the written piece of the evaluation from the superintendent those uh, pieces will come to me and I will compile for review at, at uh, most likely our August meeting. And if, it, if something stumbles, we'll do it in September. But that's the plan. So tonight for this, we're, we're listening, asking any questions about the process from here, taking the, the uh, assessment tool away with us and coming back to talk about it again in a public session at a future meeting. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Go ahead. Sorry, I moved, I have some neck issues and I was hurting myself, so I've moved so I don't have to turn my head. So I have prepared a summary and some attached some supporting documents to um, provide a little bit of information about how I have moved forward throughout this academic year toward the goals that were um, reviewed with the school committee earlier in the year. The evaluation is on the goals that were adopted, so that's what information I have presented. It is not a, um, this is not a comprehensive list of all the work that's been done, just speaking related to the goals. And I'm not gonna read to you, you all can read um, this information separately, but I wanna hit some of the highlights, which actually Kate's questions earlier did give um, a preview into some of what it was the trailer for the evaluation portion of the evening. So um, 
one of, so in this packet, there is my narrative, which is approximately 11 pages. Um, then there is a copy of the goals. So you will be able to refer back to those as they were agreed, including all the steps that were taken, um, you know, the pieces of evidence. So you'll see, and then there is um, sort of a glossary of all of the attachments, and there in my narrative, it will say attached, so that you'll know a second time that it's there for referral. So we have done, we the district, because while it's under my superintendency, certainly I am not doing work alone. So the district is referenced throughout because um, one of the important pieces of being the superintendent is to make sure that staff has the resources to do the work that needs to be done and that I guide the direction, but in no way would it be reasonable or accurate to suggest that I alone accomplish the work that's being done. So that's why um, there are a few places where I say I, and that's because that is, um, something I felt it was important you knew that I was able to facilitate personally, but that's not the only place I've been involved. So we've done a lot of work with curriculum, looking at the core. So you folks may remember earlier in the year, probably even during my interview, I talked about the response to intervention triangle, the red, yellow, and green, where the green base represents um, approximately 80% of our students, and that's where we want um, a strong core instructional program, strong curriculum to provide for approximately 80% of our students to meet or exceed the standards um, in all the content areas and to meet social, emotional, and behavioral expectations with the core program that we have. So we've done a lot of work and um, some of that was referenced earlier when Kate asked the question about what else do we need to do. So talking about all those pieces, we've begun a curriculum review process. And when I reference curriculum, that means not just the resource, but a comprehensive look at the materials, the standards, the instructional approaches, and the assessments. So um, we are continuing to build that complete picture but you will see included is the beginning of our curriculum review process. It has been reviewed with all of the um, instructional leadership administrators in the district. When I say that, I mean principals, Janet, um, you know, our facilities director was not involved in the review of the curriculum review process, but, um, so we have adopted that at the administrative level. We'll be sharing it out. It speaks to what we believe is needed in a strong curriculum. And we've looked at some dates when we know that portions of that have been done. So you'll see, for example, 21-22 for elementary literacy, but what that speaks to is the adoption of a resource. So um, we are continuing to build a very comprehensive picture so you'll see all of that. I outlined the process we went through to adopt those resources. Um, the math that was fully implemented this year, Eureka was purchased and um, adopted as well as could have been during the year prior when in part we were remote and in part in school. So this past year was the first year it could really be utilized by all of the staff, so that was begun and there are some changes that are being made. I referenced earlier the adoption of a district-wide um, early childhood screening tool, which is the ESI, and then I've identified the common assessment pieces that we have in the district. So. Some of the work that I'm very excited about is that administratively we have created elementary schedules that ensure all of our students have the time recommended for delivery of lessons included in CKLA and Eureka. So those are drafted for each of the buildings. 
there has been input in terms of, you know, this grade level can't have specials at this time of the day and that type of thing, but we needed to ensure that the consecutive minutes of instruction for literacy and math were represented. So we have been able to do that. Those are included. We also, which I'm very proud to say, have collaborative time guaranteed for every grade level through the work of the schedules. I will say in her absence, Karen and Mike Browning were huge in the creation of those schedules as well as the special schedule that um, you folks may remember hearing earlier in the year, um, there were issues with getting art, music, physical education to all of our elementary school students on a somewhat regular schedule. So that has been created. So all of our buildings have art, music, and PE for next year, um, which is outstanding, I believe. So I review the library work that has been happening, which is a huge change in our core program, um, access to high quality library materials is well on the way. There are, um, we are looking at staff reallocation, we're looking at caseloads of um, some of our staff so that we can most efficiently utilize our staff. And then, um, you know, when we talk about the impact of decisions on the budget, this allows us to ensure we're using all of our resources, not just of the money, but of our staff time. We have highly specialized staff in some areas and we need to make sure that they're interfacing with the students who need them the most. So we're looking at schedules in that regard. Um, you know we do not yet have a comprehensive social emotional learning curriculum. This is one of the I places. I am pleased to say that I have the ability to facilitate that curriculum work. Um, it's exciting for me to be able to touch curriculum again. I don't know if the members of the committee will vote that way when we're done, but right now I'm telling us we're excited. Um, so with the end of the school year, we have the opportunity to have a few more people join so that work will be in full swing. Um, and I am inflexible in my intention to have units K through 12 ready um, at least for September and October before we get back to school. So obviously it's ongoing. Um, we have some tier two um, services, primarily our coach interventionists, Title I. This is an area that again, I referenced earlier, we need to do some more um, work in terms of creating clear processes for identifying students who may need additional resources, the progress monitoring that will be used, what types of resources are good for students who require tier two types of intervention. So it's really formalizing and evaluating those tier two supports. So we need to continue working on that. We did add counselors across the district and we also filled a previously unfilled associate principal position at the middle school to support students. Um, we have added the social justice and community connections coordinator, that's Glenn Franklin. I did have to look up his job title because I never remember. Um, to work with students, I've identified that as tier two because these are students who need more support to feel connected to the school environment than what they are feeling from the day-to-day -day interactions. So um, Glenn's services, we still need to work on um, operationalizing a little bit more of his involvement, but he has been very involved in day-to-day -day interfacing with kids and students and families since he started. So. And I know he's he's been a, a not on the staff, but connected to our work for some time. Yes. When did he actually join the district? Was it May? He officially started as an employee early May. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So tier three, again, I referenced this earlier, we need to continue doing an assessment of our special education programs. We've done particular um, detailed planning around re-envisioning re our transitions program at the high school. Um, that's something that was in its current iteration prior to Janet being our special education director. And so, um, We've been working since fairly early in the year 
collaboratively with the high school administration to try and re rethink the way that program is structured. And we did hire a new teacher recently who will be heading that program. So, um, so you'll see the, um, the rest of the academic write up some of the resources, but really this is the beginning of the ensuring that we have a very solid core program um, it will be a multi-year process, but we're, we're off to a very good start, I think. Um, from a technology standpoint, nothing you folks won't be familiar with. We have aging technology. We require substantial improvements, replacements. Um, we do not have a documented refresh cycle nor a recurring funding source, which needs to be addressed. We also don't have sufficient staff to address the number of end users with technology especially because right now we have vacancies that we've not been able to identify qualified applicants for so um, we um, as you know we've talked about we have a lot of chromebooks at the end of life thankfully a capital project was um, approved to allow us to replace some teacher desktops which is wonderful so um, We've also, I believe, talked about the way that we're rethinking the use of educational software. We need to make some consistent purchases across the district. We had very fragmented use of software, one classroom, one teacher, one building. Now everything that we have in place is used across grade levels and for a, an, a clearly identified purpose. So. We have those, we will continue to evaluate whether or not they're meeting the need that we believe they meet. But at least at this point, we have a fairly concise um, list of programs that are being used. The meat of the handout you have is the results of our technology survey that we gave to staff. Um, we also need to we need to purchase more technology for the district because it's aging and, and in need of repair, but we also need to have a, as much of a comprehensive conversation about what the needs are before we purchase. Um, staff that was in place when I got into the district and staff that still remains has been pretty clear that the purchase was made without sort of that thoughtful process of why do we need technology in our classrooms? And we have a number of standalone labs. One of the challenges we're having with these labs at the high school is we're running out of classroom space for the adults that we have that need to teach our students. So it's a conversation about can we take what's in those labs and identify a device that can appropriately meet the needs. So we need to have a thoughtful conversation about that. Um, you will see the themes if you read through all the comments in the tech survey. A lot of themes about staffing levels, which we know. A lot of comments about lack of professional development time, which we very clearly know. Um, and some, some folks liking the technology we have, some that don't. But I don't know clearly yet if they don't like it because they've not had the opportunity to be trained in all of the elements of, of the pieces that we have. So I am thrilled, as I said earlier, that we have a new IT director coming on board and he has been informed he's got 14 number one priorities that he can take all the way through September 1st to accomplish. So I'll give him those first two weeks and then we're getting on him. But um, no, he, he's aware that there's a lot to be done and very excited about the opportunity. Um, Something new that we came to be aware of in terms of technology is our phone system needs to be upgraded. There is um, federal law and FCC regulation around um, phone function in terms of dialing 911. So that is a piece that needs to happen. Um, the total for a complete conversion of phone, the phone system in three of our buildings, one of which is Green River, so that's sort of put to the side. It, it's included in the narrative, but as a little aside, um, 
would be about $140,000 because we have some buildings on one system, some buildings on another system. The separate system is not able to be upgraded, so some hardware can be upgraded, some needs to be completely changed. And when I say hardware, I'm not talking about the telephones, I'm talking about the brains of the phone system. So that's something that our technology department will also need to consider shortly. I know that's a lot. Any questions to this point? Okay, I know. Um, the professional practice goal was around engaging in the work that with CES and Dr. Lourdes Alvarez Ortiz. So I included the work that we've done at the retreat, reflecting on feedback from staff with both um, sets of professional development. Um, I included dates that um, Karen and I, or Karen and I, and the remainder of the administrative team met with both. This does not include time that these folks were with our staff. Um, this was just at the administrative level. And um, I included the themes, the um, summary of the themes from the work with CES. And so at the retreat, um, we spent some particularly targeted time talking about ways that we could um, foster a sense of connectedness and belonging for the staff in each building and then things that we can support the staff in doing to foster that for our students very early on in the year. So that is work clearly that will continue. Um, Glenn Franklin certainly is a huge support in the work that CES started with us and um, we're talking with Lourdes about her opportunity to come back and work with smaller groups of staff around ways to support students who um, are dealing with trauma because we, we believe we have a number of students who are impacted by trauma. So certainly there's more narrative there. Um, the budget, we've talked about the budget quite a bit this year, so I'm outlining ways that um, we used the resources and the structure of the budget to build services at each of the tiers. Um, so you'll see we talk about professional development for core instruction, literacy materials, um, stipend funds for writing curriculum, reconfiguring teaching positions. So we moved away from technology teachers to fund some of the librarian positions, which we, we believe quite strongly we need to have our libraries open and available to our students. So um, I included that in a budget summary because I think that's um, sound fiscal practice. We also were, um, as I said, able to redo the special schedule. Not only does that provide students access to all of these special schedules, but it did it utilizing the staff that we already have and not having to post for part-time positions, which we were concerned we would need to do. Um, we added the manufacturing teacher and we have um, an applicant we're very excited about. So that was um, an addition to our budget. So tier two, we're looking at ways to um, allocate staff that is funded through Title I to match the way that DESE says we need to allocate the funds. There's formulas that talk about how much of the Title I grant should be allocated across each building. So we're working to make sure we're using those funds the way that DESE identifies we need to. Um, tier three supports, we were able to um, fund two new special education positions that I mentioned, um, but clearly we need to look at our staffing levels and the types of staff that we have to meet the needs of students with special education. Um, it's important that we're strategic in talking about, is this a teacher need, is this an IA need, is this a training issue, is it a programming issue, what what can we do and ensuring that we build a continuum of resources for our students with special needs. Um, 
again, talking about the grants that we have received. Um, I included in the packet for your review um, one of the proposals submitted to Ways and Means that was funded um, for the technology as an example of budget work. I also included the um, superintendent's message in the mayor's budget book that was submitted. And because you didn't see it enough when we were going through the budget process, I re-gave you a copy of my budget presentation to the school committee because I know it was so fun the first time. So um, we know that there was um, a difference between the superintendent's proposal, what the school committee voted, and ultimately what the city council voted. Um, so as the year closes and as we have changes in hiring and um, costs of, of other things that were budgeted in FY23, um, we'll look at how we can address the, the difference in those two budgets. And <laughs> after hiring, um, changes are made and such, it could be a fairly minimal yeah. discrepancy. So I'll update the committee as soon as that process finishes. So personnel, there are, um, we had to formalize some process regarding how we managed personnel processes. Um, I go into some of the change in fair detail, but really the biggest pieces were around consistent and uniform use of School Spring, which is our online platform for posting positions. And um, we now have some consistency in the use of that, which allows us to manage um, applications that have come in. It also saves time for a number of people because as an evaluating and interviewing person, you can assign an interview committee of staff in the district. You can um, evaluate the candidates, schedule interviews online through the program, and um, really reduce man hours needed to make photocopies and, and schedule interviews and all of that. We've used it a number of times at the administrative level and we found it to be quite effective. There are some preferences that we're working on to see if we can streamline the process for internal applicants, but um, in a general sense, it's been a very helpful process. The other piece is um, using ASAP to manage staff absences. The district had the program, but I don't believe the ability existed to really utilize all of the pieces that we have access to through that. So right now, all staff except for custodians, food service and transportation have already been using it to log all time out of work. Um, substitutes for IAs and for teachers are able to be um, assigned or taken by our substitutes that way. And we have resource documents available for the rest of the staff who aren't currently using it. And that will be the expectation when school starts is everyone is required to submit time out of work requests through the system. Um, there are still some pieces in terms of ensuring the accruals with Munis talk to ASAP, but that's being worked on. Um, one of the other pieces that I had said is that we would be working with Fernando, um, the city IT director and the business office staff at the city to continue to adopt more of the pieces of Munis. It's a large undertaking and we did meet and Andy and Loretta in the business office and, and payroll are working with Fernando, but it's really important to spend time on the front end, setting it up the right way. Otherwise you spend monumentally more time undoing and redoing. <laughs> so I appreciate the methodical way that it's being implemented. Support for administrative problem solving, one of the pieces that I thought was important this year was to establish relationships with providers and with people from other schools where we could possibly access optional alternatives to the high school for some of our students. For some of them, that is an environment in which they do not thrive. 
and our goal is to have students graduate to be healthy and happy and have the opportunity to be productive when they get out of high school. So having meetings with um, Rick Martin, the superintendent of Franklin County Tech, with Todd Gazda from CES about programs that are available. Um, Derek and Karen and I met with the former interim president of GCC to talk about creating pathways and workforce opportunities. Um, we did a lot of work with Max Fripp and Judy Raper for Beacon. That has been a very successful program for our students and we're gonna be meeting to talk about expanding and maximizing those opportunities. Um, you know, an unfortunate relationship, but we need to have is with the district attorney's office and the probation office. So we have met with them to talk about ways we can ensure we're supporting students and then um, community action, ways that they can be involved supporting students with attendance issues, with disengagement, and also um, myself doing individual problem solving and reviewing student um, situations and discipline files and case histories and working with them to make recommendations for supports and services that are needed. So. Um, I was able to do that as well. So at, you know, at the end there, I do speak to the fact that we still have some areas of focus that need to be addressed. Um, again, you folks know that. We need to continue working on the curriculum. We um, administratively have established some non-negotiables around our presence in classrooms across the district. Um, evaluating the effectiveness of the collaboration time to make sure the teachers have what they need to do what they need to do during that time, um, developing the process for review of indi individual student needs and access to resources, implementing consistent communications across the district, um, working with our communications um, consultant to ensure that we're utilizing best practice in that regard, and then continue evaluation and revision of special edu education programming were some of the areas of need based on um, my goals for this year. So, um, Thank you. you can read through. Thank you for that. Sure. So that's a summary of basically the first 10 or 11 pages of what we have. Can I ask a quick question? Please, go ahead. What did you mean when you said non-negotiables related to increased presence in classrooms? I don't understand what that means. The administrative team has set expectations for ourselves around being in classrooms with teachers, with students, and we are committed to holding each other accountable for that. I see. Thank you. Yeah. It's Thank about you for the our performance. It's not about teacher performance or student performance. It's about the work of administrators in supporting um, the curriculum instruction and assessment, we need to be there to see it, to help affect change with it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, unless folks have a different preference, I think it makes sense to um, save any further discussion until after we've performed our individual evaluation unless there's questions about moving forward with that. Um, I think we need to probably set a date to get it all to me so I can compile it. Yeah, uh, Member Denise. I'm sorry, this might be a dumb question, but since this is my first one of these, um, earlier in the year you said we were gonna bite off many pieces of the elephant. Is this the final chunk of the elephant? This whole thing? Well, or this is how I thought I did chewing on the first bite. Okay. <laughs> if that's just to keep just, with your elephant analogy. Just wondering analogy. if there's more coming after we do this or if this uh, is the completion this of This is my report to you about my work on the goals, just the identified goals okay. during the first year. You, you might remember a few meetings ago. Oh no, I know year one. I was just wondering if there's more coming from year one. or No. This no, okay, this is this is the this superintendent is the evaluation for year, year one. one. Okay, that's yes. what I wanted to know. I'm sorry. And we will do this process every year. It will right. 
ideally become more familiar. Right, I just didn't know if there was more coming for year one or if this was it. Um, I think it, if it's okay with everyone, what I would like to do is set the same date as the um, self-evaluation to also have this completed. Again, it's about the compiling time. So I think we said the 27th. We did. So by the 27th, the pieces that are the committee's individual pieces to fill out, get those back to me. If you need my street address because you're going to drop an envelope on my porch, that's fine. If you're going to scan it and email it to me, that's fine. However you want to do it, I'll knock on your door and tell you to give it to me on the 28th if I need to. The tool that you would use is the last attachment, and I did fill in on page three of seven, there's a spot for the goals to be included and for the indicators, and I have populated that already. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for all of this. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the summary. Um, let's move on unless there's anything else on the evaluation. Okay, so we've got to do an executive session. It is one we will have to come at, back and do a public vote after. Um, sorry, Philippe. Um, so I would, at this point, entertain a motion to enter into executive session for MGLC 30A, uh, Section 21, Exemption 3, which is to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares and I do declare and also exemption reason number seven to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant in aid requirements. This is just approving executive <laughs> session minutes from last month. And we, as I said, will return to open session. Can I get a motion uh, to open the executive session, please? So moved. That was the mayor and a second. Second. And we have to do a roll call vote, right? No. No? Okay. Uh, any abstentions from entering executive session? Any no votes? So we're unanimously entering executive session. We will return as soon as possible. We're not taking a break. All right, we are back uh, from the executive session, and at this point, I would like to have a motion to approve the June 2022 Memorandum of Agreement by and between the Greenfield Education Association Unit A and the Greenfield School Committee. So moved. That was the mayor, and a second? Second. Member Deneve with the second. Oh, sorry about that. And. Um, we do not need to do a roll call vote. We can just do a regular vote. Any uh, abstentions from this? Any no votes? So the memorandum of agreement does pass unanimously, and I would entertain now a motion to adjourn. So moved. The mayor. Second, Johnson we saw. Member Johnson we saw could not wait to second that. That was the quickest I've seen him move all night. Uh, any, any no votes on adjourning? 
any abstentions from adjourning. We are adjourned at 9.06. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>